Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Journey to Trauma Awareness, hosted by Clare's Trauma Informed Working Group. My name is Thomas Mulcahy. I am the Acting SIPSI Coordinator for Clare, and I'm also a member of the Working Group. We have a very full session today, and I hope you find it informative. Ashley O'Neill, the Area Manager for Tucson Midwest, and the Chair of Clare SIPSI will give the opening address. Following Ashling, we'll have Dr. Sharon Lambert, lecturer in the, in the Department of Applied, Applied Psychology in UCC, talking about Cork's journey toward the trauma sensitive city. Next, we'll have Eileen Carroll and Jacinta Swan from Clare Care Family Support Services, talking about their journey toward the trauma aware community of practice. Following Eileen and Jacinta, Cora Gwinnan from St. Caymans Community School will talk about St. Caymans' journey to becoming a trauma aware school. The final speaker today will be Lisa Marie O'Malley, the coordinator of Clare's Trauma Informed Working Group, talking about their future plans. Following this, we'll have a question and answer session. If you look on screens, you'll see there's a Q&A button. Please feel free to send in any questions during the webinar and we'll pose them to our speakers at, at, after all the presentations have been done. So our first speaker today, as I said, is Ashley O'Neill. Ashley is the Area Manager for Tucson Midwest and the, and the Chair of Clare SIPSI. She's a professionally qualified social worker who's worked in children and family services for over 25 years. She's a background in child protection and welfare at frontline, middle and senior management levels. As Chair of, of Clare's Children and Young People Services Committee, Ashley has overseen numerous projects aimed at improving outcomes for young people, including 2022's Trauma Informed Practice Conference. Welcome, Ashley. Good morning, everybody. As Chair of Clare SIPSI, I'm delighted to open today's webinar, The Journey to Trauma Awareness. I consider this a great title for the session because working towards trauma awareness and ultimately becoming trauma informed is an ongoing process that takes time and effort. Sharon Lambert, who will be speaking this morning, notes that trauma awareness is only the first of four stages to becoming trauma informed. We're in the, in the initial stages in County Clare, and this webinar will demonstrate the steps that have been taken to progress this further. So why is it important for a service to be trauma aware? When working with vulnerable children and young people, practitioners deal with groups of individuals who have experienced or are experiencing adverse childhood experiences known as ACEs. Research has shown that ACEs can have a long lasting, long life lasting effects on a person's health and well-being. People who've experienced four or more ACEs are likely to have much more challenging life experiences than other people in the population. They're four times more likely to have engaged in sexual intercourse by the, at the age of 15, four and a half times more likely to experience depression than the rest of the population, 11 times more likely to engage in IV drug use and 14 times more likely to have attempted suicide. People with six or more ACEs are estimated to die 20 years earlier than those who do, who have not had those experiences. It is essential that we as service providers and practitioners understand and can appropriately respond to service users who are living with the impact of trauma. The aim of being trauma aware is so that services better understand how trauma can affect both children and adults and impact their behaviour. This is the baseline to allow frontline services to establish positive strategies that support these individuals in a trusting and respectful manner. To give a brief background to the efforts made in County Clare on this journey, Clare SIPSI first committed to ensuring that organisations and practitioners in the county are supported as they work towards trauma awareness and trauma informed practice. This was identified as a priority area in Clare's Children and Young People's Plan, with Clare SIPSI's Children and Young People's Plan, with the objective being to enhance practitioners' skills in the area of trauma informed practice. SIPSI established a trauma informed working group in 2022, with the ISPCC acting as a lead partner agency. The group included professionals across a number of organisations, including SIPSI, the ISPCC, TUSLA, Shannon Family Resource Centre, Clare Care, CAMS, Clare County Child Care Committee, CLDC and St Cayman School. Their mission was to develop a countywide trauma-informed, trauma-responsive strategic plan and to develop an action plan with specific targets in place, which works towards developing a countywide trauma-informed training and resources plan. Once established, the group completed a needs assessment in County Clare. Survey responses from over 100 practitioners in County Clare demonstrated the need and a desire for upskilling about trauma-informed practice. Just over half of the respondents 
answered that they had never received any form of training or briefing about trauma-informed practice. Almost three quarters did not feel that they had sufficient professional knowledge of this topic, and a further 86% expressed interest in professional development in this area. Addressing the lack of sufficient professional knowledge, the working group set about researching and gathering material relating to trauma-informed practice, which they developed into a padlet, which is an online resource which includes relevant information for practitioners, links to online trainings, reference templates for both organisational managers and school educators, podcasts, YouTube videos and other forms of media. Finally, it includes information on vicarious trauma and self-care, reminding practitioners of the importance of their own health and well-being. This Padlet is freely accessible to everyone and has a wealth of resources to assist the practitioner and organisations on their trauma awareness journey. Lisa Marie will talk more about this later in the webinar. Next, the working group organised a conference which was held this time last year. The Trauma Informed Conference was attended by over 100 frontline staff and management in County Clare. Speakers included Aideen Brenock, Clinical Director of the Sensory Attachment Centre in County Down, who spoke about best practice approaches to trauma in childhood. Dr. Ala Elkhani, Global Humanitarian Consultant at the UN, talked about supporting families affected by war. And Aoife Dermody, co-founder of Quality Matters, recounted experiences of organisations who implemented trauma-informed practice. The conference was very well received and served to reinforce the commitment to developing trauma-informed practice and highlighting the desire for support for services to become trauma-aware. The working group has continued its work in the background since then and secured funding through Health Ireland funding and the Clare SIPSI to source additional training. They have been linking with colleagues in other counties and in other regions and national services to identify opportunities for shared learning in Clare from other trauma awareness initiatives around the country. Members of the group have attended various training sessions, seminars and conferences on the topic of trauma, both in person and online, to identify training that can be specifically adapted to meet the needs of practitioners in County Clare. Later in this session, they will update you on their progress. Of course, their latest output today, this webinar, has been, been another avenue that they have progressed and has been quite the journey to organise and arrange. Each of today's speakers will talk about their journey towards trauma awareness and the steps they've taken to reach their goals. Sharon will talk about Cork City's endeavours, Cora, Island and Jacintha will mention small practical elements that they're able to implement daily in, in daily life in their facilities. For those of you who are listening, your next step in this journey may be broad and far reaching. For others amongst you, it may be just one small step. Every step, no matter how small, is a step in the right direction. This can have a huge impact for our service users in how they experience our input into their lives. It can help us interpret their behaviours with understanding and kindness and deliver skilled responses that meet need in better ways. Thank you all. I hope you enjoyed the morning. Thanks, Ashling. Th thanks very much for that, Ashling. Um, I'm aware that Ashling has to run to another meeting now, so Ashling, I'd just like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to accommodate us today. And um, I'm staying here for a while. Oh, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ashling. Um, so next up, we have Dr. Sharon Lambert, who's going to be speaking about Cork's journey towards a trauma-sensitive city. Um, Dr. Lambert has been a lecturer in the Department of Applied Psychology in UCC since 2015. Before this, Sharon worked for many years within community-based settings that provided supports to socially excluded groups. Sharon's research interests revolved primarily around the impact of psychological trauma on development its link with homelessness, substance dependence and mental health, and consequent considerations for service design and delivery. Sharon is interested in trauma at individual and systemic levels, for example, the social determinants of health such as poverty, homelessness, ethnicity, and how social exclusion or experiences of discrimination are a toxic stressor with the potential to be experienced as a trauma. Sharon regularly, regularly provides guidance to national and international organisations on designing and delivering trauma-aware services, policies and practices. Welcome, Sharon. Thanks, Thomas. So, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, Cork's journey to uh, being a trauma sensitive city, um, but I also want to spend a couple of minutes thinking about, about why, because one of the, the reasons why implement, implementation can be difficult is, is that sometimes we forget about the core concepts and having a sense of shared concepts from the start. So 
I just, I suppose there's a lot of things on my mind in the last couple of weeks because there's a lot of very challenging and difficult issues happening. And if you take, you know, the riots in Dublin, for example, I know from talking to my own students and people that I know in court that they've experienced an increase in um, very overt uh, discrimination against them. So there are, you know, black and brown students, for example, in UCC who feel fearful. So there are constantly challenges going on in our environment that we need to be mindful of and how they fit in with with the, the kinds of things that we're talking about today. So when we think about trauma, it's very easy to recognize some traumas because they are, you know, horrendous, awful events. And often when people think about trauma, they think about the kinds of things that happen interpersonally. So things like abuse and violence. But there are other things like bullying. So bullying during childhood, for example, can have a profound impact on a child's mental health and it can last for a whole lifetime. Um, and anyone who who might have seen the documentary uh, two nights ago about a beautiful traveller boy called Patrick and the impact of being bullied because of his ethnicity on him and at 12 years of age, you know, dying by suicide. So so that's that's a trauma and it's causing trauma within the, in the travel community. So things like poverty can be a trauma, peer rejection and having no friends, experiences of racism, death, multiple and traumatic loss. So suicide is, is a complicated bereavement. And if you're from a community where there are multiple suicides, um, that can be experienced as a trauma within that community. Exposure to community violence, food scarcity, experience of the care system, not having access to the type of educational systems that meet your needs and living in an unsafe environment. So I want to take a minute just to think about race based traumatic stress, because that is something that's on my mind for the last week. Um, well, it's always on my mind, but it's particularly at my forefront this week. Um, so race based traumatic stress is is the impact on racial and ethnic minorities um, of experiencing discrimination as a psychological trauma. So, you know, we've heard about how having four or more ACEs uh, can reduce the lifespan by about 20 years. Actually, being a member of a racial or an ethnic minority group uh, also reduces your lifespan and increases physical health issues and mental health issues because the stress of, of racism and discrimination. Any marginalized or stigmatized racial or ethnic group can experience this racial trauma and you don't have to be the target yourself personally. So, if you take what happened in Dublin, last week you, you you can be from a minority group and not have been present in Dublin last week but be living in Ireland and witnessing people who are writing in the streets and saying clearly racist things can impact on your sense of psychological safety and we all have a responsibility to make sure that everybody in our community feels safe particularly in organizations where we work if you have diversity in your workplace we have to take proactive steps um, to make sure that people feel psychologically safe so I'm not going to go through this, but I suppose the reasons why somebody, why a county or a city or an organization might want to become trauma sensitive is because they do recognize that experiencing psychological trauma and toxic stress impacts on thinking and behavior. So, you know, sometimes it can be a view when you're talking about being trauma sensitive, that you're being really soft. Um, in the face of what's sometimes being described as challenging behaviour. And that's not what being trauma sensitive is about. Trauma sensitive is about understanding the neuroscience and the neuropsychology behind the impact of stress and trauma on the brain. So when people have experienced chronic stress, it, the brain becomes wired to scan the environment for danger. So even when there isn't any danger, the brain is on alert. And when the brain is on alert, that means people are going into fight or flight mode. So some people disengage from services or, or they're seen as not motivated um, or not trying hard enough. So they're the people who are in flight. And then you have the people who are in fight mode. So they're the people who are described as being challenging. Um, and a trauma sensitive service understands then that that's, you know, something that just happens in somebody's brain. It's a normal response and we try to design and deliver our services to make sure that we meet the needs of everybody. So in the face of that, then, you know, if you're dealing uh, in, if you're working in an organization where you're dealing with people and trying to support people who've experienced a lot of trauma and stress and um, they do bring challenges and sometimes 
there's a kind of a two pronged effect in terms of how that can impact on individuals within the organization and the organization itself. So if you're working in an organization where people tell you about their challenges and their difficulties, it can be really hard to to bear witness to the really horrendous situations that many people are dealing with, and that can have an impact on the staff members' mental health. Also, if you're working in a service where you're dealing with people who present as, as being emotionally dysregulated, aka challenging. So if you have somebody who comes in who's angry because they're upset or they're frightened, and um, that can impact uh, on us as workers as well. So we have to be aware of the exposure to trauma within our communities and how it can impact on staff in terms of compassion fatigue, secondary traumatic stress and burnout. So once that starts to impact on staff, and um, that starts to impact on the organisation. So you can have high staff turnover, you can have long periods of, of illness, staff illness. And also if you have a bunch of people who are working together who are all really stressed, it has the potential to cause HR issues because people start not getting on with each other because they're all really stressed. Um, and that's a function of stress. So we all have to be on, on the same page in terms of all of that. So taking into account that we know that trauma is something that happens to lots of people. Most people will experience at least one adverse in, uh, experience in their lifetime. Some people have way more than their fair share of adversity. Um, you can have people who, who've experienced a couple of adversities and because they've experienced those in the context of not having enough protective factors around them, then those adversities are things that they just can't manage with. They can't cope with them and they become totally overwhelmed. And lots of people um, can get themselves in other difficulties like drug and alcohol use. So we have data from various different agencies in Cork about the levels of trauma within different groups. So, you know, there's there's very obvious groups. We know that many people who are experiencing homelessness have experienced more than their fair share of adversity and people who are using mental health services, people who are involved in the criminal justice systems and um, young people who are um, early school leavers have often experienced uh, different ranges of trauma and of course uh, young people who are in the care system, uh, refugees and migrants, asylum seekers and members of the traveling community. So that that's all our people. There are people in our communities and, and many of them have experienced a lot of trauma. And unfortunately, sometimes the people who need to access the services the most are the ones who struggle the most to access them. Um, and, and that's why you design trauma sensitive services and the more services that are trauma sensitive and the more that are working together in collaboration and um, then it starts to take the pressure off individual services because everybody's on the same page. And if you think about, you know, so there's obviously, you know, that going back to the Dublin rights, so when I was driving in this morning, they were talking about it again on the radio and, you know, the need for a justice response. And obviously you have to have a justice response, but it's not just justice, it's mental health services, it's education, it's social protection, it's employment, it's housing, it's all of those services. And if all of those services are tra trauma sensitive, and they are all delivering a really good service and all from the same page. We actually reduce the amount of um, people who are distressed in our communities, which makes it easier for everybody in every service and it makes your whole community safer. So in terms of Cork City's journey, um, it started off in April 2019 where 350 um, people from across a range of different services attended a two day, tra two day training on understanding the impact of of developmental trauma um, on children's brains and bodies, including obviously um, adverse childhood experiences. Um, after that, then people, you know, came forward and uh, a trauma interagency steering group was established. So that included people from the addiction services, the education sector, justice sector, um, public services and hospitals. Um, Jennifer Hayes and Sandra Coogan um, you attended a, an action on on uh, on trauma conference in Belfast and, and spoke to other jurisdictions where they were moving towards being trauma sensitive cities. Um, we linked in with um, the World Health Organization's European Healthy Cities Task Force because they're trying to to create a, a separate task force, which is trauma uh, aware cities. 
in January 2020, 450 individuals went to a two day training uh, again on on adversity and uh, trauma and the need for for cultural sensitivity. In September, um, they rolled out the um, screening of the, the movie Resilience to a number of different organisations, including youth workers and family support workers. Um, since January 2021, there have been monthly steering group meetings, um, bringing together you know, all of the agencies in the city who said that they were interested in doing this and having input then. So, so when we have our, our steering group meetings, we're, we're doing two things. One is that we're talking about our plan and then trying to keep the motivation going um, by having somebody who's further along in their journey coming in to talk to us. So for example, the Lancashire Police came and spoke at one of those. They are trying to make their area trauma aware. And that was actually coming from the policing sector because they were starting to consider violence as a public health issue and how people who perpetrate violence and people who are who are victims of violence um, experience negative health consequences as a result of violence and seeing perhaps intergenerational trends um, in terms of people who were presenting to the services. And then in October, there was a six day uh, 2021 there was a six day pilot training, so 10 schools and two completion um, programs received trauma responsive education training. So it was specifically tailored um, towards the education sector and that was delivered by um, trauma responsive education, which is is a, a company that delivers training. So so since then, what has been happening then? Um, so Cork City um, created its own uh, e-training module which went up on on HSE land and the feedback on that has been good in Cork outside of Cork uh, the feedback has been it's very Cork centric um, of course that would be a Cork thing to do would be to make it very Cork centric um, so that's available on HSE land and then there's a community of practice so the original steering group was made smaller in order to make it more effective because sometimes when the group was too large there was not as many things are being followed through on as, as they should have been. So now there's a smaller group. Um, a pledge was drawn up. So a pledge was drawn up that said, you know, what your organization committed to doing. So you can't just turn up and say our organization wants to be trauma sensitive. You have to sign this pledge and say that you agree to, you know, doing the following things. And then a survey sent out and you know to see you know have you done x y and z um there's a trauma strategy being developed for cork city including a roadmap and a model of best practice and then there's continued um development of new partnerships and collaboration so i think the most recent thing that was done was during the summertime there was a trauma conference held in mtu um, the monster technological university and that was uh, supported by so HSE Social Inclusion Cork and Cork City. I suppose one of the things with the Cork Trauma Sensitive City is that this is coming out of the Lord Mayor's office. Um, so it is being driven from above. In my experience, where people try to implement trauma awareness or being trauma sensitive within their organizations, where it fails is where you don't have buy-in from the top. It has to be buy-in from every single level. And the other reason why sometimes it fails is when there is a crisis. So COVID was a good example. There were there were lots of organizations that were motoring along quite nicely in terms of moving towards being you know, trauma aware or trauma sensitive. And then when COVID hit, at a time really when they needed to to ensure that those uh, trauma change teams in organizations to ensure that they were given the time and the space to continue on their programs they ended up being pulled away and put into other different parts of the organization and then the plan to being trauma aware was abandoned um and unfortunately it was during a time when lots of people were experiencing trauma so it's about uh, you know, making that pledge that you were going to do it, having your roadmap of how you're going to do it, and then when a crisis hits, knowing that that's exactly the time that you need to dig in even further and uh, hang in there and push through. So there, there are you know different levels. So 
not every organization can be fully trauma informed for lots of different reasons. If you take you know, HSE, for example, it's a very large organization. It's dictated by national policies. Sometimes some of those policies are coming from the Department of Health, for example. Um, giving you an example, you know, there's a report out a couple of months ago about how the uh, child and, and uh, adolescent mental health services are at breaking point, but we now have an embargo on the recruitment of, of new psychologists. So a whole bunch of psychologists that were due to start working in September are not now um, because of an embargo on recruitment. So so that's all of those things are beyond the scope of, of a, you know, you might be working in an office in Ennis, but because decisions are being made somewhere else, it's going to impact on your ability to deliver your service. So what organizations can do is just decide whether they want to be trauma aware, trauma sensitive, trauma response or trauma informed, be realistic about what they can achieve and then aim for that and stick to it. So if you see Cork City has not aimed to be a trauma informed city because the Lord Mayor's office would not be able to, to control what happens in every single organization. So they have looked across, you know, the various different organizations that want to sign up and what they've accepted is, is that where they are aiming to hit is to be trauma sensitive. Um, so the benefits of being trauma sensitive is that you can have reduce incidents. So if you take Novus and Limerick, for example, um, they rolled out uh, being trauma informed in different pockets of their organization and um, they work with people who are experiencing homelessness. And if you take McGarry House in Limerick, for, as an example, it's a low threshold um, service. So you have people there with quite chronic mental health and addiction issues who've experienced trauma and other social difficulties. And um, they saw a huge reduction in the number of incidents where it was you know, service users, aggression towards other service users or service user aggressions towards staff. Um, you have less staff turnover because you have less burnout when you um, understand the impact of trauma across the organization, not just in the service users, but its impact on staff and its impact uh, on the organization in as a whole. Um, you have less um, people out on sick leave, reduced HR issues and less public complaints. So the only way that will happen is by having an organizational culture that really embeds it, um, making sure that staff are given appropriate resources to be able to manage their, their stress and their trauma. I have worked in frontline services. I wasn't Mary Poppins every single day. Sometimes I was really tired or I had my own stressor maybe from my own personal life, which reduced my ability to have compassion for others. So that makes me a normal human being. And then if you're going into an environment where I might work with somebody, you know, who comes in upset and what does that look like? They might tell me to fuck off and mind my own business, but they're traumatized and they're upset. So if I'm not at my best, my ability to handle that is not as good. And um, so I have to ha have access to really good supportive supervision structures. Organizations need to do reflective practice where you're really, really honest. If you take Cork City as an example, the week that the e-training module was launched um, within a couple of days. I happened to be supporting a family who were at risk of experiencing homelessness and they had a very, very unpleasant and extremely negative experience trying to use a public service in Cork, which was connected to uh, City Hall. Um, you know, so we had to have, well, when I say we, I rang up given out and for them to be able to be a trauma sensitive city, you have to be able to hear what's wrong, what's not working. You have to be able to hear it in a non-defensive way. We don't get things right all of the time. If you're not having awkward conversations about your service, then you're not doing it right because there's no way um, that everybody's happy all of the time. Um, at a minimum, we need to be trauma aware and stick to that. Um, and we also need to practice self-compassion. You can't be reflective if you're not compassionate towards yourself. Um, you have to be able to acknowledge that sometimes we make mistakes. We have to be able to forgive ourselves and we have to take care of ourselves. So that's it. I've run out of time and I better stop now before Thomas starts sending me messages. So thanks very much. Sharon, thank you very much for that. <clears throat> that was very interesting. Um, I I thought it was very good to to note how 
how Cork City said, how you said that we have to be realistic that while trauma informed would be the ideal, that's not realistic for some places. And this, the way this webinar is the journey to trauma awareness, that might only be the first of four stages, but it's where Claire is at at the moment and it's where we realistically think that we can have the most impact and hopefully down the line that we can work towards being, work towards being trauma responsive, trauma sensitive and then trauma aware. So thank you very much for that, Sharon. So speaking next, um, we have Eileen Carroll and Jacinta Swan, who are going to be speaking about Clear Care Family Support Services journey towards towards becoming a trauma aware community of pra community of practice. Eileen Carroll is a social worker who's been who's been a social worker for over thirty years before she joins Clear Care Family Support Services in two thousand eighteen. She has a keen interest in the area of trauma and sees it as, sees it as a fundamental lens when supporting the families. She's particularly interested in finding ways to bring an understanding of trauma to the kitchen table. Jacinta Swan is a principal social worker in Clare Care with extensive experience in family support, child protection, children in care, advocacy and aftercare services for, th for over 30 years. She is interested in how using a trauma informed lens and in working with family supports, minding the moments with them so they can avail the supports on offer if they need them. Welcome Jacinta and Eileen. Yeah, we're okay. Hi, thanks, Thomas. Um, thanks a million, Sharon, for that really interesting talk. As a good Cork woman myself, I'm delighted that that's happening in Cork. And also, we loved the Cork e-learning um, module as well, so that might explain um, our, our involvement with it. Um, I suppose just uh, we'd just like to thank the committee, really, for inviting us to talk today. And that I suppose when Eileen and I were putting together this presentation, we were really thinking about, like, what would be useful for other agencies to hear, what for kind of the practical examples. So our hope is, is that at least you'll come away today with some ideas of maybe where would you start and what would be useful to you. Um, our presentation is going to take you through the journey of what we embarked on since 2020 to become more tra trauma aware. And we'll briefly give some context about how, how we began. Um, which was in particular about relationship-based practices where, where we started. Uh, we'll share with you some practical initiatives we developed based on consultations with parents and children and staff. And we'll also look at shared learning approach um, to the Corky Learning module, Becoming Trauma Aware, an introduction to psychological trauma. And we'll also talk a little bit about um, another resource that we used, which was the NHS Scotland resource, called trauma um, taking a trauma informed lens to your work. And all of these supported the development of a trauma aware plan for our services for 2024. We've included at the end of the presentation some of the references and um, to the resources we used. And I suppose they helped us along the way and they, we thought they may be helpful to you as well. Uh, I suppose while Eileen and myself over the last few years have kind of held the process around becoming trauma aware, we really are really conscious that like what's been achieved by the team is really a wider family support team effort. And we just wanted to really acknowledge that uh, before we started it all. Uh, for those of you who don't know Clare Care, um, it's the registered charity and it, we provide a broad range of um, services across County Clare. And that includes the home care and uh, daycare centres for older people and community and residential addiction services in Bushy Park and a family support service, which is the one we're going to talk to about today. Um, Clare Care has supported children and families in County Clare since 1968. And I suppose from the very start, um, those who delivered the service were mostly coming from social care and social work backgrounds. And I suppose the, the building of relationships with clients and agencies like was seen as a core part of, of the work and, and really the bread and butter of the work and a key motivator of change. And today um, in Care Care, our family support team has 25 staff and the majority of those um, are social, work, social care and social work backgrounds. And more recently, we've expanded to um, child and adolescent counsellors. Uh, our family support service is funded by TUSLA and it's a community-based family support service providing individual and group support for parents and children. And we also provide an advocacy service for parents and children in care. So I suppose our journey really become, to become uh, trauma aware began in around 2019, 2020, which is interesting as, as Sharon was talking about the introductions of COVID. 
Um, I suppose for us, it was a real change, um, particularly around even things like the technology that suddenly we learned to use things like the Microsoft Teams and, and finding new ways of communicating with each other. But I suppose alongside that, Clarecare were developing a, a data management system which focused more on kind of numbers, outcomes, um, which was a new thing for us. And then as an agency, there was an increased focus on enhancing governance. And this brought with it an increase in policies and procedures. And I suppose at the same time all of this was happening around us, there was a few of us kind of started asking questions like, how do you balance the tension between the system, what systems require and what relationships need in practice? And then that led to conversations like, how do you hold relationships with families as a core part of, of practice? And I suppose we had a real concern that we'd lose what we know works with families in the middle of external changes in areas like data management systems and, and, and procedures. And I suppose at the time when, when we were thinking about that, um, I remember asking friends of mine who worked in business, uh, how do they still hold on to their original philosophy and values in the midst of changing environments, uh, focusing more on procedures, evidencing outcomes and systems? And one of them said systems are part of our reality and aim to support what we do. And you just need to make sure you also capture what you value. And this for me opened up the question, what do we value? And for Clare Care Family Support Practitioners, um, understanding and seeing relationship building as a key element of the work with families and a potential catalyst for change is core to what we value. And we, and we needed to find a way to articulate that in a much more conscious way than we had been doing pre previously. But at the same time, while we know relationships are important, we also know that relationships can be messy, unpredictable, um, complex, and complex, and they ask a lot of us. We know a great plan on how to capture what we value or even go a goal to achieve it. Uh, what we gave ourselves was the freedom to explore relationship-based practice and what it meant. And this was a very organic process, which we'll talk a little bit about later. To explore what's relationship-based practice, we, we read articles such as Authentic Engagement um, by Tim Moore and also linked and had discussions with academics in the UK, UL, NUIG and UCC. And I suppose from this exploration, we learned um, that relationship-based practice is essentially a way of being. It supports and underpins a way of working, informing practice, theories, intervention, methods, policy and personal approaches. And I suppose understanding that gave us a language to explain what we do and it validated relationship building as part of our work. And we also found that it supported the trauma literature, echoing how taking time with all relationships, clients, with ourselves in self-care and with colleagues strengthens practice with families. We began to share and discuss what we learned uh, with the wider family support team, put relationship-based practice on team meetings, and from each discussion we got energy to keep going another bit. We began new conversations, like what does re this relationship-based practice and trauma awareness look like for our service? How do we make it our own? Um, and parallel to these questions and discussions at the team meetings, as a team, we took part in trauma training with Sharon, um, and a webinar with Jennifer Hayes trauma, around trauma and war, along with a webinar with Siobhan McLean, social work educator in the UK, which was around back to basics in relationship based practice. And each time when we looked at, the, at these um, videos, we had team discussions afterwards about what it meant for us in practice and care care. So this prompted a new starting point uh, with the question, how do we welcome people into the Clare Care Family Support Service? And I'm going to hand over to Eileen now um, to share with you what happened next. Thanks, Jacinta. So we were left with the question, how do we welcome people into the Clare Care Family Support Service? And as I suppose as a way of kind of helping us answer that, we invited some parents to come into the service last November and to talk to them about their experiences of being part of the Family Support Service. We had a number of questions that we were, we were curious to find out about. We were wondering how they, their experience of being in the service compared with what they thought the service would offer before they came in. Uh, we, we were wondering uh, what it would be helpful for a new service user to know from their point of view about the service. And we were asking them about suggestions that, you know, would improve the service from their experience. 
So the parents actually contributed an awful lot. They were very honest and heartfelt. They talked a lot initially about the personal impact of being referred to the service. They talked about shame and feeling judged, uh, feeling fearful as parents and just wondering how people would perceive them as being uh, referred to a service that their parenting was being uh, less than what, what, what it should be. Um, they talked a lot about the stress actually of waiting and um, not knowing what they were to expect when coming to the service. Um, they also talked about the experience of coming into the building and particularly here in Ennis. Um, obviously people might know the Ennis building, it's an old building, and they talked about that feeling institutional when they walked in. They, 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 some of them maybe remembered the building as being part of the convent and they talked about the nunny kind of feel in, in the building and one parent felt like she she was walking in a little bit to an old person's home and um, they gave a lot of feedback on the space as they walked in and the information being maybe a bit of information overload and they felt there could be more provision made for a child friendly space. Um, they also gave us a lot of information about their experience when they were in the service and they talked about the importance of being listened to. Uh, they talked about the support workers having patience and being with them through the process, how it's important to have somebody to support them and to help them to lighten the burden of being in a, a complex maybe parenting situation. They talked about trust and trusting their worker and the worker maybe getting where they were coming from. They talked a lot about feeling safe and feeling held, which was really important as a starting point for them to engage with the service. In, in the midst of the, that conversation, they had uh, talked a bit about uh, the letter they received uh, at, as an initial starting point and um, referred about how that could be improved. So they gave us some very practical suggestions as starting points um, and we, we, we ran with that. So we, we looked initially at the welcome letter. Uh, and we very much had the parents kind of feedback in our minds, their, their voices about feeling maybe the shame and the fear uh, was, was very present. And we wondered, you know, how, what could we do to lessen that for them? Uh, we looked at the language um, in the letter that we already had and we, we, we were looking at making it less formal, less factual, being more softer and more empathic. Um, so we included sentences like, we appreciate that waiting for a service can be a difficult and anxious time for you and your family. It's so just acknowledging that and then giving clear information about who to contact when you're waiting and that we have a parent support line and that you can access that and you will get support while you're waiting. We also give um, much clearer information about the support that they could expect when they came to the service so that parents could understand what was going to be involved. And we talked about the voluntary nature of the family support service. So, so along with that, we, we ran with the idea of looking at spaces within the service. Um, and my colleague Debbie O'Donovan was very instrumental in this piece of work. Um, and while we, we really could hear that the parents had a lot to say about the reception area, particularly in the Ennis office, there was very little we could maybe do to impact that. So we decided that we would actually look at the family room where we meet parents and children. So as you can see, this is a couple of images of the room before we did some, some work on it. Um, we were talking uh, about what we wanted in, in considering what we would need for this space. And um, we felt it was really important that, you know, there was a felt experience of walking into this space that gave the message that, you know, you're safe in this space and you're, you're welcome here. So as you can see, the room um, before we gave attention to the room, the space was a bit cold, a mix of colours and images and furniture. Um, it was it was it was previously looked at, and we had tried to make it a bit more family friendly, but we knew that we could we could actually improve upon it. So our budget was very tight. We had only three hundred euro. We weren't on one of these fancy makeover programs, and. Um, we, we needed to retain the multifunctional aspect of the room because it's, it's used for many different things. So we, we looked at bringing um, a little bit more softer furnishings into the room, bringing a, a bit more coordinated look to make it a, feel a bit more calm. Um, we also included some soothing um, pictures and some more positive images with positive, positive messages. Uh, more plants were introduced 
a small play area was created for younger children and the room was repainted in a, in a lighter tone. So while it, it wasn't a dramatic makeover and we didn't have a large budget, but it, there was a significant impact on the feel of when you walk into the room. It's much, much more calmer and it's a much more pleasanter space to walk into. So this has given us a lot of motivation. We've looked at other rooms in other buildings within Clare Care and we've started this process um, through that consultation with the, with, the, with, the, with the parents. So in addition to working with the parents, we also wanted to hear the voice of children who are using the service. And my colleague Sinead Curran uh, had the idea that perhaps we could actually develop a cartoon style form format to actually support us in um, maybe having a conversation with children about their experience of the service. And as you can see, it was a very simple cartoon that we started with, and we were hoping that it would support children to describe their experience of meeting their support worker and to ask them, what would they say to another child who was about to start using the service? So as children do, they, um, they take things uh, on themselves and, and uh, a boy who was working with my colleague Acacia decided he'd do his own cartoon. Uh, and as you can see, he, he, he's made a fabulous cartoon describing his experience when he initially came into the Killaloo office. So it, the initial part of the cartoon talks about him actually being in trouble in school and playing on his, um, his, his, his computer and his mum coming and telling him that he needs to go and meet a, a support worker. And he's, he's really unhappy about this and they're going in the car and he's really angry. And he comes to the, the Killaloo building and he's not aware that actually this is a building that actually has services for older people as well. So he's, he's a bit confused. He's, he's going up the stairs with his mom and he's wondering, God, maybe vampires live here. He's, he's, he's really not sure about the place. And then at the top of the stairs, he meets Acacia with a big smile and a big hello. And she brings him into the room. And as you can see, he's described this as with, in beams of light, you know, uh, walking into the room with toys, with a space for him to talk and to um, be supported. And um, he, he describes going and uh, leaving the building. And as you can see at the end, the before, uh, where he's really vexed and kind of angry looking. And after, he's like a little angel. So I suppose for us, it was an awful lot that we felt that this, this um, child was telling us. Um, we felt that we could develop supports to help parents to talk to children a little bit more about what to expect when they're coming to the service uh, so the parents can actually be prepared themselves and also prepare the child. We can use much more visual information to support children. We can use photos of a support worker. We can use photos to describe the building they're coming to and photos of the space that they will be in. And all this uh, will alleviate any anxiety and stress that a child and a parent would have in coming coming to the service. So that level of con consultation uh, was really, really supportive and helpful to us. So while all this was going on, we were very aware that um, as a staff team, there was a lot of different people at different in different places and with different levels of understanding around trauma awareness. Um, some staff had done specific training themselves. Some had done their own reading and learning online. Uh, and as Jacinta mentioned, we had done some uh, session with Sharon and we'd also done a, a team sessions looking at Jennifer Hayes uh, webinar and um, you know, we had started a little bit in coming together, but we wanted a place for all of us to start as a team. So as Sharon had mentioned, we had uh, found out about the Cork e-learning Becoming Trauma Aware, an introduction to psychological trauma through the SIPS group here. So we, we, what we had suggested, we, we would start with this as our starting point as a team and all staff completed that e-learning module on HSE, HSE land. So in, as a follow on to um, all staff being um, completing that model, we were very, I suppose we were very aware since COVID that a lot of us have sat on our own in our offices and um, doing e-learnings 
And while oftentimes, you know, we're, we're learning information and we're, we're trying to make sense of it on our own. Um, if, if, if you're trying to maybe tell somebody about something you've done a month later, you might not have been able to put it into your own words. So we really wanted to create a space where we could actually start to say, well, what does actually this mean for us as a team? What does this mean for our practice? And how do we actually support each other to make sense of this? Um, so we, we came together uh, in a shared learning space um, and we, we really thought that, you know, we, we, we'd, we'd discuss what the e-learning module kind of meant for us and, and our practice and what maybe might be the next steps that would inform practice for the team. So as a way of doing this, we, 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 we developed some reflective questions which we asked in a, a small group situation. So we, we asked questions like, what point stayed with you from the e-learning? What surprised you? Anything that needs further explanation? What do you need next? What do we need next to help us inform? our practice as a team. And there was it was a lot of discussion. This is probably one of the first times we'd come together to actually talk about trauma awareness in this way. A lot of staff related some of the, the material on the e-learning to their own personal experiences. And uh, there was a lot of discussion around the impact of trauma. There was questions around, you know, why are some people more resilient than others? And Sharon referred there to the numbers of ACEs and, you know, what supports somebody to come through and why is it that other people struggle more? Um, we talked a lot uh, about intergenerational trauma uh, in the communities that we work with. We talked about building relationships and the difficulties about building trust and a lot, lot more. It was a really um, enriching uh, start to looking at this area, and um, we were we were we were we were also conscious of trying to capture um, where where people were at in their own learning. So we we did a training audit as well that day, and out of that. Um, discussion and, and, and understanding, we uh, we learned that two members of the team had actually done specific training themselves. So we'd, we we agreed that we'd have further shared learning with those two members giving an input to the team. Um, so Debbie O'Donovan had completed the UCC Continuing Professional Development in Trauma-Informed Care Theory and Practice Certificate. And Debbie spoke about her experience of using Dr. Marie Lotti's thermometer of regulation as a reflective tool, both in her practice and in supervision. And I think Sharon there spoke about the importance of um, self-care and self-reflection and supervision spaces, and also to look at how we can maybe find ways to, to support us to kind of get a sense where, we're, where, where, where are we at? And, and Debbie has used this tool very effectively um, in her work. Uh, Jackie O'Brien had completed a Child Psychology Institute working with children who have experienced trauma, which was facilitated by Lorraine Lynch. And Jackie spoke about the importance of regulation supports for children as a key first step in uh, supporting a child and in supporting a parent. Uh, so out of that kind of uh, conversation that day, um, Jackie with uh, Acacia and uh, Jackie uh, has a student, Tina, who is a social care student on placement with us. They started to look at the whole area of regulation and um, connection for children and parents and have started to develop re regulation and connection support uh, resources for, for families. Um, so they, they've been working on developing support boxes um, and as, as we all know, children and, 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 and families are very different. There's lots of very different needs and children uh, are not one size fits all. So there's some suggestions here as what might be helpful, but we very much would be advocating that these resources are uh, looked at in conjunction with the family, in conjunction with the needs of the child and to see uh, what would support them. But a suggestion in terms of regulation would be looking at touch, fidget ties, stress balls, smell, something that calms or stimulates depending on what's needed, something that's visually pleasing, look, liquid timers or mindfulness jars which can be very easily made, something to encourage movement, maybe a beanbag to catch a skipping rope, uh, suggesting jumping jacks. 
something to listen to, you know, making a playlist that can be down regulating and soothing or up, uplifting um, for a child. Something to taste, something crunchy or sucking or chewing can support regulation. And then obviously with, with regulation, there, there's more opportunity for connection for a parent. So building in that connection uh, point as well with board games, storybooks, decks, cars, film nights with hot chocolate, breaks from the screens with treasure hunts or a walk in nature, breathing exercises uh, and mindfulness colouring. So these were some of the suggestions that um, they came out of those shared learnings um, uh, following on. Uh, uh, as a team. Uh, we, we also decided that we would uh, take a next step uh, following on from the Cork e-learning and Jacinta is going to talk a little bit more now about that. Thanks Eileen. Um, I suppose as Eileen mentioned before, like like with any group, there's different levels of interest and knowledge around trauma aware practice and staff are coming for a variety of experiences. And it's with staff like entered the conversations at different points that made sense to them. And I think that was something that was really, really important as we we enter in different ways. Some people love the articles, some people um, like the practice, like the boxes there or it, it needs to make sense to them. But we were very mindful all the way along that you, you were actually you needed to be, I suppose, inclusive of wherever everybody was at. Um, and I suppose, but we also saw like through all the different steps and, and it was certainly very organic and we just went from one thing to the next, that you could see the real potential to build on this and um, that a lot had been achieved, but there was also a real energy in the group um, about kind of, God, the potential of this um, could have make a real impact on, on people. So I suppose we decided then that we were going to kind of look at how could we make a team plan um, for 2024, which would kind of pull together maybe some of the things we did, but also then have the actions from it. So to help us do this, um, we linked with the NHS Scotland, taking a trauma form lens to your work. And this was it's 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 designed as a workshop and um, that the Corky Learning uh, module suggested as the next step. And I suppose that just in going through the workshop, it's it's facilitated by um, Dr. Caroline Bruce, and it focuses on exploring what changes you might want to make in your setting using a trauma-informed lens to your work. And I suppose it really felt like the Caroline Bruce was with us in the room. Um, and I suppose for myself and Eileen, it helped give a structure to a session with, with the team, but at the same time allowed us to kind of maybe change some of the questions which would fit more with the family support service. And the the session starts with a very powerful animation and then it, it follows when she brings us through um, five stages, which include realising the prevalence of trauma, recognising the impact of trauma, taking a trauma form lens and then applying a trauma informed principles. And for each of those sections, we divided into small groups and then took the feedback on the flip chart. Um, Caroline suggested this would take about an hour and a half. I suppose we decided because there were so many of the small groups and to allow taking the feedback that we'd use the full morning, which was 10 to 1. Um, again, like as Eileen described in terms of the Cork e-learning, like the opportunities for staff to really reflect and practice what it means to them um, was a really important space and it was really, really lively. And a lot of things came up like, you know, how you even balance the tensions of child protection concerns, while at the same time you're aware of parents' trauma and, and also the, just kind of how we manage that in the day, in the day to day work. So I suppose following on from that that workshop, then um, we collate, Eileen and I collated the the feedback, and that distilled it then down into kind of what were the kind of key areas that were coming up, and what came up was around buildings, communication, practice, and consultation, and then with actions identified, potential actions identified out of each area. And I suppose as we were grouping then the, the actions, we were really conscious of the trauma-informed principles of providing safety, choice, trust, empowerment and collaboration. So the process hasn't been finalised. We're going to be meeting in January um, to pull together um, how, where myself and Eileen got to and then to try and make a, an action plan together for 2024. 
So I suppose in in trying to pull it all together, when when Eileen and I start reviewing the process of becoming trauma aware service and 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 the process that we as a team had gone through, there were key phases in that process, and it started off really with an openness to explore. There was no prescribed destination apart from trying to understand and improve practice with, with families in, 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 our, in our service. So we had questions and we were open to explore. I suppose the next stage was gathering the information. And I suppose there's so much we've learned, no more than the information that's on the padlet that SIPSI have put together. There's so much information out there. It's And some of it's so good. And, and most of it's actually available for free. But, it, but it's also about deciding what's useful for your service. What's the fit? And alongside the information that's available, like I suppose that what was key for us was the spaces to review and understand it as a group and what it means as an individual practitioner when you're meeting the next person in the, in the day. But also then as a service, how, how does this make sense even in how we explain what we do? So then consultation was a key part of the process. Um, and I suppose in particular, we've learned so much from the parents and children we've consulted with and they've empowered us to make the changes. So I suppose hearing their feedback was so powerful, but we also realised we actually could make those changes really simply. Um, and that, that was really important. And then we were able to feed back to them about the changes that we had made based on what they told us. So there's also the consultation with staff about being trauma, what tra being trauma aware means in practice. And I suppose it was an opportunity to really look at like what are the real struggles and also the real wins in this work and by giving the spaces to reflect. So very much like what Sharon had said as well, that space to just even, and it's not always that long, but actually you're acknowledging this is worthy of, of, of um, exploring. And I suppose then there also needed to be actions. I suppose we could really have got so easily got lost and be very overwhelmed actually in the literature and the endless possibilities without making it real to our service. And, and I suppose that part was kind of like, it could have got so complicated that we'd become paralyzed. So we, we were trying to really make it kind of small actions, one step at a time, and then see what happened. And I suppose these actions can be so simple, but I suppose our experience has been, they've been really effective to help people feel safer and more empowered within our service. And from these actions, just like the cartoon Eileen described, or, or the trauma-informed plan, you have opportunities then to go and explore again. So whatever comes out of that, you can you can kind of look at it again and then see what information we need, see who we need to consult with, and then you have your next round of actions. So the process continues. So I suppose that's our journey so far. Um, like really for us as a team in, in Clare Care, it's been really energising um, and confidence boosting for us as a team. And I suppose it's really allowed us to hear and see the experience and knowledge that staff on the team have, and then been in a position to share it with others. Um, it also provided us a way to balance uh, the tension between systems and practice, um, which I described at the beginning. And I suppose we, we've really seen how the systems have begun to work to support our practice. Um, so I suppose just when we started off, this is one of the quotes that, that we had seen, which, which captured really how we see it. And I suppose now these few years on, it, it, it's become even more, more important actually for us. And I suppose it's about knowing all the theories. You can master all the techniques, but as you touch one human soul, be just another human soul. And I suppose it's for us to remember that piece as we meet the next person in, in the day. So I'd just like to say on behalf of myself and, and Eileen, thank you so much for listening to us today and giving us this space. And we have all, um, any of the resources are available at the end. And um, please contact us if you need any other information. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jacinta and Eileen. That, that was great. Clare Care seems to have done so much work, but also, as you said, it's all in kind of bite-sized manageable steps. Um, for, for me, I particularly liked hearing how at the very start of the process, you got the parents and the children's input. Um, it just reminds me of the phrase, nothing about me without me. And I thought that, that was that was a really good first step before the organisation ever did anything. You've done fantastic work. That's amazing.
Um, before we move on, can I remind people that there is a question and answer facility there? So we've had some questions come in. They're still coming. They're still coming through. If you have any questions for any of our speakers, please feel free to hit that button, button and send them through, and we'll compile them and ask them, ask them of the speakers after all the presentations are done. So moving on. Our next speaker is Cora Gwinan, who's a school chaplain for St. Cayman's Community School, who's going to talk about St. Cayman's journey to becoming a trauma-aware school. Cora has been a teacher and school chaplain for over 20 years. She's a qualified guidance counsellor and offers wellbeing support to young people in a private capacity. She studied and engaged in trauma awareness training, attachment and trauma-informed practice for a long number of years. She's just completed research on guidance counsellors' experience of working with students impacted by ACEs, and she has a passion for supporting young people to have a voice, building resilience and promoting wellbeing. Welcome, Cora. Thanks very much, Thomas, and I'm delighted to be here this morning just to share our journey um, in St. Cayman's Community School to becoming trauma aware. Um, I'm a school chaplain in St. Cayman's for 17 years, and my main role, I suppose, is supporting students in their well-being and mental health, supporting parents to, you know, to advocate um, services for their children, and supporting the well-being and mental health of all our students and staff, and engaging with external agencies um, in relation to our young people. Um, so I have a lot of engagement with students, parents and the wider community and external um, agencies. And I suppose what's the purpose and the overall reason that we wanted to become a trauma aware school? I suppose just prior to COVID-19 and since COVID-19, we saw that there was an increased level of anxiety among students and parents were struggling to know how to support them. And young people, I suppose, were nervous. They, they, they didn't have the capacity to realise that they could help themselves. We saw increased levels of school refusal, not just at junior cycle, but also at senior cycle um, following COVID-19, which was kind of a new, um, a, you know, many we would have seen school refusal up to junior cycle, but it was a new experience for us to see students at a fifth year and sixth year um, not being able to come to school. Um, we had seen an increased need for individual um, pastoral support for students and um, the number of young people seeking support and needing one to one support had increased and we were struggling to cope with the numbers that needed it. We had seen that there was a lot of young people that had reduced levels of resilience and lack of capacity to cope. Um, we had seen an increase in the number of students with tendencies um, associated with ADHD, um, but would had no diagnosis, diagnosis. And, you know, we had an awareness that young people who were experiencing trauma often had many of the um, traits of ADHD and we needed to, you know, support these young people. And we saw that there was growing social issues within families and within the community. And we, ne we knew that we needed to change our approaches in how we supported both the young people and their families here in St. Caymans. Um, last year, I also did some research and I suppose the, the topic of my research was an exploration of guidance counsellors' experiences of working with students impacted by adverse childhood experience. And although I had done a lot of research before and I'd done a lot of work around trauma and attachment, um, I suppose some of the, um, the some of the research and some of, I suppose, the evidence that I got from meeting guidance counsellors all over Ireland were, was eye opening. Um, I found out that no training in teacher training colleges about trauma or the impact of ACEs is currently done in any of um, the courses that are training teachers. The impact of ACEs is lifelong on educational, emotional, physical and social development. We knew that school could be a protective factor um, for many young people and the progression for students impacted by trauma can be so complex and many students due to school refusal, literacy, numeracy, um, just social issues that their progression post um, secondary school was very complex and many of them didn't progress at all. We um, addressed the benefit, we, I suppose I saw the benefits of having one good adult in a young person's life and how it can change their trajectory. And school was one of the best places to have that relationship and for teachers and mentors and SNAs could be that one good adult. Um, we saw that the collaboration with outside agencies to support students is needed as a matter of urgency. Um, this is very complex and I suppose most young people that engage in one-to-one -one support are engaging with outside services and it was trying to get collaboration with all these services to support the young person. Um, we, I, 
dis discovered that there was greater resources needed within schools, personnel and expertise, so that a lot of teachers may have had an awareness of what trauma is, the impact of it, but a lot of them hadn't engaged in training um, because it's not directed by the Department of Education. So it was at the discretion of the principal or student support teams or uh, critical incident teams within the school to choose whether that was an option that they wanted to do for themselves. Um, also, we had seen through our student support and our behavioural support programme here in the school, the impact of building relationships. So both our student support and our behavioural support was very person centred, was trauma informed, it was done through a trauma lens. And when we, I suppose, when we looked at the pupils who'd engaged with student support with me and the guidance counsellor and our two behavioural support teachers, the positive changes in the students well-being, their mental health and their behaviour was dramatic. And students, when we, you know, we, we did a little bit of research with students and evaluated and reviewed how they how they found, you know, engaging with the student support or behavioural support. It was so positive and so beneficial and we learned quite a lot from that. Um, and I suppose coming from that then, we saw that we needed to become a school that moved from being reactive um, to being proactive in our responses to trauma. Um, it, you know, over time we had seen that, you know, if we knew there was a student in difficulty or had, you know, issues, we would throw all the resources we had at that student. All teachers would be aware they would interact differently with that student and we would give every support that we possibly could and all various different initiatives. And we had seen the benefits of that across the board. And we knew that if we took that approach to all students in the school, that the, there would be a, a bigger impact. And so we decided that we needed to interact with all students um, from a trauma lens. Um, we realised that we needed to have a basic understanding of the impacts of trauma so that students can be supported to engage in school and in various learning experiences. And we knew that, that the one good adult and that all teachers and all members of our school staff and SNA and the caretakers, the auxiliary staff, the secretaries, that those interactions were just equally as important. And we wanted to be proactive in creating a school environment where students can attend, feel safe, build relationships and be supported to reach the potential. And that was, I suppose, the, the main purpose of why we wanted to move from reacting to individuals who were having difficult times to having a school where all students could feel that. So what, what were the initiatives? I suppose we're at the very early stages and we knew that most of our staff would have had limited ability, some are not limited ability, but limited awareness around trauma awareness and trauma informed practice and the impact of trauma. And some teachers um, would have had very little knowledge around it. But we felt that that wasn't, we shouldn't just stop and wait for everybody to become trauma aware. We wanted to kind of be proactive in our approaches. So we started our process and we're, as I say, we're in the very early stages of it. Um, last year, all our senior management, that's the principal and deputy principals, our student support team um, completed the NEPS e-learning training and that's an introduction um, to becoming trauma-informed approaches, the stress factor, getting it right and that was delivered by the local NEPS team um, in, in Clare. Um, then th in our, as part of our Crow Park hours in August of this year, we invited NEPS back in to do a watered down version of that e-learning training to introduce staff to trauma, the impact of ACES and how students are impacted and the student in their classroom, how they may present uh, um, as a result of being impacted by trauma. We set up a trauma um, working group here as, um, in the staff and um, so staff chose to be on that and one of our senior management is on it as well and I coordinate the team. We sent links to training by NEPS, the Cork e-learning training, the Padlet by SIPSI and various other um, trainings to all members of staff because following the training um, of all staff in August many teachers had come looking for extra training they were really wanted to engage in it. It made sense to them. It made them understand why certain students were behaving or acting or in a certain way. And th there was huge interest in it. Um, we have been a restorative school for a number of years. Um, so most of our staff are trained um, in restorative practice. Um, 
some of us from the trauma informed working group here in the school joined the trauma work community of practice for schools and um, by Sinead Collins and we got a lot of information from that about other schools were far more were far further in their journey of becoming trauma aware. Um, we have a therapy room in the school and we I suppose it was a room that was used as a store and we changed it into a therapy room where um, I suppose outside agencies that come into the school could meet students. We would often have social workers, family support workers, psychotherapists, art therapists um, and various different people coming into the school and when they would come in we'd be trying to find a room. We'd be like and sometimes they could be shoved into any room or any office that you know wasn't suitable and we just thought that it was nearly going against the whole purpose of having those people come to the school to meet students and families. Um, so we did up that room, um, we, nothing like what Jackie and Eileen have done. Um, we're in the process of it, but we did it up nicely. We put nice comfortable chairs, blankets, heaters, cushions, and we had therapeutic boxes um, with sensory toys in it with nice lamps and a plant. And again, we can use that when we meet parents. There are times when parents come into the school and sometimes it can be very difficult for a parent to come back to somewhere where they were traumatised themselves. And I often saw that, you know, coming into school was re-traumatising parents and then we were bringing them into a real formal office. Sorry about that. Um, coming into maybe a boardroom setting and that was very intimidating for them. So it's it, that was one of the, I suppose, small little stages that we did this year. We contacted other schools who were further on the journey and uh, becoming trauma aware and Fairhouse in, in Tala in Dublin um, have started um, changing their policies and their practices and their behaviour um, policies have now become relational policies. And we're going to meet two schools in January. Our team from our working group are going up to meet those schools just to see in, in, in person how they're getting on. We'd initial target that all staff would know the names of all the students in their class, because as I said, we knew that not everybody was trauma aware, trauma aware or trauma informed and that we're on a process and we're on a journey. But we decided we would have one target um, for the month of October and November. And it was that every teacher would know the first name of every student in their class. And that might seem quite easy, but if you have 30 students nine times a day, you have a lot of students names to learn off. But we also said that if you do, you know, if a student isn't noticed or if a student isn't acknowledged or called by their first name, you know, we, ha we have to start somewhere. And the impact of that has actually been profound. Um, a mother came to me a couple of weeks ago and told me about her son who's in third year. So he's been in our school for three years. And a result of that initiative, he was called by his first name this year. And he was so delighted when he went home to his mom to tell her that a teacher, a number of teachers, it turned out, had called him by his first name. And you might think, my God, that's something simple, but it was profound. And we share, I shared that experience at a staff meeting recently, and you know, teachers were blown away, and it just had it had such an impact on that young person's life and his mom, and. It's, you know, it's something that we're really working hard on um, and it was just that small initiatives work and make a difference to people's lives. Um, where do we go from here? Um, as I say, we're on a long journey and um, we're compiling um, techniques for all teachers around the three R's, how to regulate, how to relate and how to re reason with the students. So we're, we're, the working group are putting together um, a little document so that to help teachers, how they can, I suppose, be more trauma aware um, around those three R's. We have therapeutic boxes in our, we have two ASD classrooms, we call them our ASD hubs um, and they're sensory toys and we have um, therapeutic boxes in all our ther in, in all our student support offices. Um, in our boardroom, we have one that we can take out. As I said, we have that therapy room where the art therapist comes in, two psychotherapists, an outside agency can use it. And um, we're in currently putting together therapeutic boxes for all year head offices. Um, we've just, um, our application to get a therapy dog has been accepted. So we'll have a therapy dog, dog a therapy puppy joining our school next week. And the impact of that is huge. Um, last Friday, the trainer from my canine companion brought her therapy dog in around the school. 
and there was one student who um, has autism and she's not in our autism hub because she's in first year and we don't have a first year autism class this year. And that student rarely speaks and school is so overwhelming for her that she finds it very difficult to interact. And I had met her on the corridor um, when I was coming down with the lady from my canine companion and she came into my office, um, the little girl, to see the dog. And she stayed for the whole of break, which was 15 minutes, and she never stopped talking. And it was just she was so regulated. She felt so safe um, with the dog there. And she told us all about her dog. So the impact of therapy dogs are huge. Um, we're involved in a consultation um, after Christmas with students and parents about how they think that we can become trauma aware and how we can support um, tra you know, becoming trauma aware in the school, um, because it's important that we've all stakeholders involved. Um, all our interactions, so all our meetings with students, all our meetings with families and with parents and guardians and outside agencies, all our meetings, be that um, working groups or staff meetings, are all now through a trauma lens. And that's the hope that we're working on that. Um, and that trauma awareness is now on the agenda for all staff meetings. Um, we have decided this year that we're not going to look at policies, that we're just going to try and get little things right and get training done this year. But uh, next year we're going to look at our policies and how we can make them trauma aware. And that's where we want the parents and students to become involved in that. So we're on a journey. We have just begun. We are committed to making our school a safer, more holistic environment where students can reach their potential. And um, I'm, if anybody has any questions or I can share any of what we've done here in the school, um, I, I'm more than well, you can contact me or contact, ask questions at the end. And I've shared some resources here, of some of the um, training we've done, some of the schools that are far more um, advanced in their trauma aware journey. And um, so thanks for listening. Thanks very much for that, Cora. Um, Cora, it was absolutely astounding to hear the impact of, of the target of just remembering everyone's names. Remembering someone's name seems like such a simple thing that people probably take for granted. And I suppose it ties in with what Ashling said in her opening address as well of how small steps that we might not, that practitioners might not realise are important could have a huge impact on the, on the people we work with. So that's fantastic. Really, really well done on what the school is doing. Um, <clears throat> before we move on, I'm going to remind people again just about the question and answers. Uh, thank you for thank you to those who sent them in. They're all they're already coming in, so I, I appreciate that. If you have any more questions, feel free to send them in, and we're going to ask them to the speak of, of the speakers afterwards. So moving on, um, next we're going to have Lisa Marie O'Malley, who is the coordinator of the Clare Trauma Informed Working Group, speaking about the working group's working group's future plans. Um, Lisa has been the the coordinator since early 2023, and in this role she works to bring the represent representatives of different frontline services in Clare together to build a strategy to make Clare a more trauma aware county. Particularly through her experiences in volunteering, Lisa Marie has seen firsthand the prevalence of trauma in our society and the real impact that those in frontline services can have in either mitigating or exacerbating an individual's experience of trauma. She's passionate about making sure that everyone's voice gets heard and everyone's perspective is considered. Welcome, Lisa Marie. Thank you, Thomas. Hello, everybody, and thanks again so much for all of you for joining us for the webinar today. And uh, before I go any further, I'd just like to take a moment to thank all of our earlier speakers, Ashleen, Sharon, Eileen and Jacinta and Cora. I hope you all found their presentations as interesting and useful as I did and that you got some really valuable takeaways and practical ideas that you can bring back to and adapt for your own organisations. And now that I've start, started thanking, I might as well keep going. So I also just want to take this opportunity to give a, a big shout out and thanks to Workforce Learning and Development for their help in supporting this webinar today. Uh, if it was left up to me to manage the technology, as anyone who knows me uh, can definitely testify to, uh, there would be no chance of it running smoothly and the, the laptop would probably be out the window at this point. Uh, I also want to thank all of our partner organisations uh, for the Clear Trauma Informed Working Group and all those who have collaborated with the working group to build trauma awareness in the in the county. Um, and I would just note there that, you know, there's too many names for me to mention right now, so I'm not going to start in case I accidentally leave anyone out, but you all know who you are and, and I really want you to know that your your efforts are deeply appreciated. 
And finally, of course, I'd be completely remiss if I didn't take an opportunity to thank all the members of the working group themselves. Uh, they've all been so invested, so passionate and so willing to give up their time to realise our vision for a more trauma aware Clare. Um, and, you know, our, um, our trauma informed working group has a lot of different frontline organisations represented, which is obviously brilliant, to, brilliant to see and to hear from. And both Cora and Eileen, the earlier speakers, were, are actually working group members. So they give you a very good sense of just how lucky we are with the, with the group that we have. Um, and now moving away from my thank yous, um, I know Ashley already touched on it, so I'm and so did Sharon. So I'm not going to focus on it too much uh, in terms of the prevalence of of Trauma, trauma in society and why being trauma aware is so important and the reasons that the working group was established. Um, but that said, uh, the reality is, um, and you know, Sharon, Sharon mentioned it, we can see, see it pretty clearly in our, our, ourselves every day if we just take a look at the headlines. Um, it, it's painted all too vividly, the traumatic events that are happening in, in our country and in our world. And it's clear that we as a society need to be doing more to help people with the after effects. And that's why I'm so heartened by the great turnout today. Um, and I, you know, I, it's great to see that there is that interest uh, in the topic. And it's always just stayed with me um, to remember that being trauma aware will never harm anyone who isn't traumatized, but it can make such a difference uh, in the lives of people that are. And in fact, given that it's rooted in, in relationship building and empathy, uh, I'd be of the view that it, it can only be a positive experience for any service user, irrespective of whether they suffer from trauma or not. Um, and now just, to, I suppose, to move on to the working group's plans to achieve our vision of a trauma aware Claire going forward. Uh, we have been, been working to develop a, a pretty comprehensive plan to meet the needs of frontline workers. And, and those needs were, were identified in that countywide survey that Ashley mentioned that we sent around in 2022. And we've identified four key pillars to help us achieve our plans, and they are collaboration, developing and signposting worthwhile training, sharing resources and knowledge, and support and implementation. And I'm just going to briefly take a moment to, to touch on our work on each of those points. So on collaboration, as I mentioned already, we've been so, so lucky with all the people, including academics, subject matter experts, organisations and trauma informed practitioners who have really all rolled in behind us to help us uh, begin to realise our vision. And I will just note as well, uh, if there is anyone listening who is particularly interested in collaborating with the working group or learning more about us, uh, please do feel free to email myself or Thomas to the email addresses provided and we'd be only delighted to hear from you, certainly. And I am also conscious that our, our audience isn't entirely clear based uh, on the webinar today. So I do just want to also make sure to say that we would love to build links with organisations and groups outside of Clare as well and share any any learnings and resources with them. So so please don't let geography be the reason <laughs> that you don't reach out. Uh, we personally uh, have leaned very heavily on Cork for inspiration since they as, as, as was outlined earlier, are further along on their journey than us and are, are aiming towards a trauma sensitive city. Um, we are absolutely off the view that it makes sense to share the learnings across the board and not try to, to hoard any knowledge on trauma awareness within Clare. Um, Ireland as a whole is a small co country and, you know, trauma aware county is, is a great start, uh, but it is just a start. And, you know, we think the more people that we can gather with us on the journey towards a trauma aware country, the better. Um, and then just to, to touch on some of the other pillars as well, as, as Ashley mentioned already, there was a really strong appetite for training in the 2022 survey results. And with that in mind, uh, within the group as a whole, we've been really busy in the last couple of months sampling the different tra training um, that is available. And it, there is a wide, wide range, which is obviously great, uh, of both in-person and virtual options. Uh, and the survey results in particular really did state that, you know, people wanted to get uh, in-person trauma awareness training workshops in Clare. Uh, that was, you know, really uh, one of the key takeaways that we had. And, you know, bearing that in mind, we are planning to facilitate uh, some in-person workshops on trauma in Clare in 2024. And um, I will be, uh, you know, sending around more information on those uh, in, in early 2024. 2020, 20, yes, it is 2024. Um, so, yeah, do keep an eye out uh, on your emails for that information. Um, and ultimately down the line, um, I suppose just to give you a sense of, of where we're, we're hoping to go, we are um, 
we are aiming to coordinate a comprehensive training plan for practitioners at various level of training needs. Again, recognizing that different organizations and different people are at different stages in their journey and also maybe looking for different things out of, out of trauma training. And we're also hoping to use our shared learning from the experience of working group members, um, as Eileen and, Jacin uh, Eileen and Cora have already done today, and also the learnings from other trauma-informed organisations to help develop an implementation plan for services, which they can then use to, to begin to support their, their own journey towards uh, being more trauma aware. And just as you wait for 2024 to roll around for all that training on the topic of resources, I do just want to flag again that we have a collection of recommended resources uh, available on our Padlet um, and that they are all um, you know, recommended resources on trauma that we have reviewed. Uh, they are all completely free to access um, and can be can be accessed through the QR code or the link, which will be um, which will be shared um, here. Uh, and there is an awful lot of information there, but the Padlet is broken down into categories and that will hopefully help direct you to what is most relevant and interesting to you. And I would also just like to stress that it is a continuous work in progress and we will be adding to it going forward. So it's not you know, a fully exhaustive list um, and we are absolutely open to any suggestions or feedback that you might have on that. Uh, we will also be looking to add our resources to the Clare SIPSI website on trauma, including a copy of this webinar, a link to the Padlet and a resource pack. And we also want to make sure that we are promoting any upcoming events on trauma that would be relevant for frontline workers in Clare. So again, just feel free to reach out if you think that anything should be flagged by the group. And on that note, for those for whom it's applicable, just keep an eye out for the upcoming workshop on vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue and self-care, self which will take place in Clare uh, in March of 2024. And we'll follow up later today anyway with an email and we'll then plan to send around a quarterly update on the workings of the working group, uh, which will include like things like changes to the Padlet, any upcoming future events and the signposting to any training. Um, but, you know, if anyone receives the email and wants to be removed from the list, of course, just let us know and we'll be happy to do so. Um, and, you know, as I'm preparing to wrap up here and hear all of your questions, I do just want to note that we've heard from an awful lot of people that they don't feel qualified to take steps towards trauma awareness in their organisations without extensive training. And obviously, we fully endorse the idea of building your knowledge on the topic. And of course, we plan to support you and offer multiple supports to do so. Um, however, we as a working group really wanted to use the, the webinar today to stress the importance of implementation following on from any webinars and training, rather than kind of falling into the trap of paralysis by analysis, where, you know, it can be overwhelming really to find a place to start. The, the webinar was all about giving people the opportunity to hear about and learn what others are doing in practice. And, you know, ultimately the training is there to inform practice and is only effective if um, it is used in our day-to-day -day lives. And what we really hope that you take away is what can be achieved even on a very limited budget uh, if you have a can-do attitude and the willingness to take a few simple steps. And again, we just say, like, please don't make perfect the enemy of, of good. Um, and, you know, I would suggest that you take at least one idea from the speakers today. So be that assessing your letter to service users, be that reflecting on, you know, any simple changes you can make to the space you use thinking about how you can best solicit honest feedback from service users, agree and commit to trauma training and gather as a group to reflect on the takeaways, um, build in a therapeutic box, or if you're in the incredibly lucky position to do so, get in a therapy dog. Uh, no matter what it is though, no matter how big or small, we hope that you feel empowered to take that first step and bring as many people as you can with you. We know that we've a long way to go to get to where we want to be, but as the quote goes, a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. Thank you all so much again. And now I'll hand back to Thomas for questions. Thank you, Lisa Marie. Um, <clears throat> that was great. And I suppose one of the big things that strikes me in that is, as you said, sharing of the knowledge that's come across in all of the speakers today. Uh, that the people have people have expressed how they don't have the knowledge they want. They want to gain more knowledge, and it's out there. It just needs to be shared. And and it's not a, a trauma awareness and the journey isn't. It's not. It's not exclusive to Clare. It's not exclusive to Cork. This is for everyone um, in Ireland and abroad. And we just need to share that knowledge. So we're going to move on now to the Q&A session. Um, again, if people want to send in any more questions, feel free to do so. They're all, they've been coming in throughout, but we welcome more. Um, so I'm going to start. The first question I have in front of me is for Cora. 
And Cora, the question that I have is, how would you like to see schools engage with outside agencies to support young people in, in schools? Um, hi, Thomas. Thanks very much. Very good question. And it's a really complex um, situation. So we would have for any student who has, um, you know, struggling with their well-being or mental health, we'd often have to engage with, you know, maybe um, TUSLA. There might be psychology involved. There might be family support workers. And in schools, it, it can be very difficult to know what it, where everybody's going or, you know, what's what you know what the program for that person might be or they might be engaging with outside counselling so I suppose it would be really really good if it became practice um, something like a mehil where people can sit around together and you know take a trauma lens trauma approach to supporting that young people in school we have a practice here that you know we would try and engage bring parents and guardians and all the services involved with a student and um, together but it's very difficult from a school's perspective trying to do it trying to agree various different um you know people's calendars and their diaries but i think it needs to become practice i think all the need all the you know multi agencies need to agree that school have an important part to play in the well-being and mental health of young people so i think it needs to be um not just uh, kind of on the agenda for schools but with all the agencies um and all the the supports out, outside um the schools yeah thanks very much cora um, so moving on, the next question I have is for Eileen and Jacinta. Um, was there any resistance to, to, to becoming more trauma aware, uh, such as around the lines of training fatigue when you implemented the, your journey? Yeah, yeah. And, and again, a very good question. And I suppose we can we can all be in terms where, where there's you know a lot of demands on training of different types. Um, I suppose for ourselves in relation to trauma awareness, the Cork e-learning is a really good starting point. Um, it's it's 45 minutes, I think, to do uh, as a, as a, and it's hugely informative. There's a lot of material in it. The way it's you know presented, um, you know, supports getting a, a basic knowledge. Um, and I think it was very doable for our team, you know, so the ask wasn't huge. And I suppose that that ask came in conjunction with all the other bits of foundation that we'd started to put down in terms of the relationship based practice. The session we had with Sharon, the session we had with Jennifer Hayes, you know, the relationship based practice session that we had. So we were starting to do these small inputs together as a team and then, you know, making that request, I suppose, for the e-learning was it was another kind of relatively doable input to ask for the team. Uh, I think what really made that uh, come alive was the, the sharing afterwards and not just leaving that as a box ticked, that's that, the team has done it, but to actually come together and actually kind of maybe acknowledge there was bits of that that you'd forgotten about because you'd done it, done it three weeks ago and God, somebody would remind you about that and they've added another understanding. You hadn't thought about it in that way. So I suppose, you know, I think it is about balancing the demands that you maybe are on your team, the time that your team members have, but also actually seeing the value then of making a start with some Thing and actually, you know, bringing the team together to consolidate and integrate that actually understanding of the learning that they've done on their own. I, I think as well, it's 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 making like I was something we were really conscious of all the way along. It wasn't imposing something. Like each step we took, we reviewed what would we need next or what would help us understand more. And I think the other part was acknowledging we all enter into this information in different ways. So, like you could have had certain trainings that wouldn't have suited some people, you know, so you had a variety, whether you were reading something, whether you were looking at something, the discussion, you know, for some for some people, it was really, really important. It had to be practical, like show me what it looks like, you know, like as opposed to maybe reading about it, you know, so I think it, it's it's what are the needs of your group? And then also then the piece that you review as you go, like we didn't kind of have a major plan. You were learning as you were going. And and we all were, you know, it, it was acknowledging there were no experts in it, but yet there was lots of expertise in it within the group as well. Yeah. That's great. Thanks very much for that. Um, there was another question that came in asking if the welcome letter could be made available. Um, we will we'll send a template of that out to attendees uh, af after the webinar. 
Um, Sharon, the next question I have is for you. So um, you touched on compassion fatigue and burnout in your presentation, and Cork is much further along in its journey than Clare. Has there been any feedback from practitioners in relation to compassion fatigue or burn or burnout? Are they witnessing an impact since Cork started its journey? Um, so it varies across organisations in terms of walking the walk and talking the talk. So one of the things that we do know is that uh, compassion fatigue has increased in most frontline services and anyone who works in frontline service will know um, that it's actually quite difficult to get people and to keep people. Um, people have changed the way that they're working since COVID. A lot of people have reflected on themselves and uh, their own work-life balances and whether they, they want to continue in roles they were in in the past. Um, I can't remember who, who I think it was Lisa Marie uh, spoke there, you know, about, you know, not only within organisations are there challenges, there are organisations within the community and then there are global challenges. So every single human being really who has any ounce of compassion is concerned about uh, the, the direction in, in which things are going, political, instability and I mean getting up this morning and realizing that Elon Musk you know is trying to interfere in, in Irish politics you know stop the world they want to get off like but um what we what we know from from looking at the services is that there are organizations who were really proactive so they put in things like access to external uh, counseling you know but not just EAP services where nobody actually rings, you know, picks up the phone and rings, but getting somebody to come into the organisation. I'm thinking of a particular school now in Cork where there were a lot of challenges and a lot of difficulties for the students and the parents. So they have a therapist who comes in once a month and they do group supervision with the teachers. Um, so where organisations went that extra mile, that has made a difference. Where other organisations are floundering they are, you know, experiencing those challenges of staff going out sick and um, dealing with HR issues, etc. Sorry, that was a very long answer. It's the last week of term. I have nothing left in my batteries. <laughs> you might not be happy with me then, Sharon, because I have more questions for you. <laughs> um, so Sharon, when there's a traumatic event such as the one in Dublin last week, the community, the government and the organisations are often quick to respond with services and so on. But what advice would you have for schools or, or community organisations that experience a traumatic event or critical incident? The first thing is to mind yourself, because, you know, I know a lot of people talk about this in training, about when you get on an airplane with children, they tell you to put on the mask yourself. So the first thing to do is to mind yourself. I I did hear somebody talking on the radio this morning saying that they were really annoyed that only two psychologists were sent out to the school where the incident occurred. I'm actually surprised that they were able to find two psychologists to go because we don't have enough. So so sometimes you have to like if we're relying on external agencies to to send people in, they just may not have them because resources are really stretched. So the first thing to do is to mind the staff team, make sure that you're all OK, that you're all grounded and what supports do you need? And um, the second thing is thinking about do you need what kind of interventions do you need? So so often there's a look to psychology and I would say psychology is for moderate to severe mental health issues. Psychology is not an answer to to everything. So using resources that we already have, one of the best resources we have for young people is the people who already exist in the community, like youth workers and social care workers, the people who already have relationships with young people and families. So if we take care of them, then they can support the, the young people and the families. And you may not need uh, external people coming in in the way that, that we sometimes think that we do. Sometimes it can make the situation worse because they don't have a relationship with with the the community services or, or the kids and, and their families. Thanks very much, Sharon. Um, my next question is for for Cora, Eileen and Jacinta. And Eileen, I know you have to you have to leave a little bit early, so I'll I'll pose it to you first. Were there any unforeseen difficulties or obstacles that you had to overcome um, on this journey? Eileen on mute.
sorry about that. Um, I, what I was just saying for myself personally, I suppose, it, you know, initially you can have an idea and have a, a desire to actually start a process and it can, can be very easy to stumble very quickly and get overwhelmed and think, oh gosh, you know, where, where does this go? So I, I think it's it's important really to, to start my, by maybe bringing in a, a number of people that actually can support you with that. Um, and, 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 and to start to make the simple steps, because there is a lot of literature out there, there's a lot of information. That there can be a real sense that I, I, I need to know more or I need to have a lot more information or, gosh, I don't even know the difference between being trauma aware or trauma sensitive. You know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, I need to know all that stuff before I can even start to actually do something because I might cause damage to somebody. And, and I think the message really, you know, that, you know, we, if we're interested and we, we, we carry that sense of, you know, wanting to engage with people with a sense of empathy and a sense of compassion for ourselves and in terms of how we work, but also to actually look at making those small steps, um, then that, that, that actually is the, the best way to overcome any sort of sense of the overwhelm and the obstacles that you might feel that you might meet within yourself or within the whole process. Mm. And I think the opposite kind of happened in some ways when we started, we, like in a way we put our own barriers, but like what I am saying in terms of oh, maybe we should know more or you should get somebody in or you should this or you should this. So we created barriers in some ways at the beginning ourselves. But I think the start was bringing people who were interested together and having those kind of quest, like questions and see where did the questions bring us. And I suppose the other, like the opposite happened actually, it kind of took off way quicker and it kind of became something else much quicker than we imagined. So as opposed to being a barrier to it, it actually gave us energy. It actually helped us. It kind of, yeah, that you kind of, the more you're on a right path, things kind of arrive to help you go the next bit. You know, so I think it was, it's, it was empowering really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Great, thank you. And Cora, um, for yourself? Um, I suppose there's no director from the Department of Education, you know, supporting schools to becoming trauma aware. Um, so it takes leadership, it takes um, people at the in management, the principal and deputy principals wanting to have to become trauma aware. And it takes then, I suppose, people on the ground, teachers and SNEs um, who hope who who will drive the process. So I think the greatest barrier really, there isn't a national directive for primary and post primary schools to become trauma aware. Now they are rolling out training with NEPS, but again, it's up to the management within each school to decide if that's something they want to engage for their staff. Um, so I would see that as being the greatest barrier. We do have, you know, um, indicators for well-being, which came about as a result of the new junior cycle framework, and they're great. But I think it's really important that, um, you know, training and, you know, advocating to become traumas where it's driven from the top down. Yeah. Thank you. And Cora, I think this question is for you as well. Um, uh, one of the attendees is asking, what is in the therapeutic boxes? Yeah, and I should have had a photo and I apologise for that. So I want to show you if you can see them. So with some things like these, you can get them in the two euro shop. There's sensory toys. There's like fidget and um, poppets. We have um, these little guys. They're many of the autism students um, in our hub love these. We have potty, we have play-doh. And um, we have some students, you know, are very you have to be conscious of their sensory issues. So not all students like these things with the hair sticking off them. Some students love them. Um, but I have a couple of students that I actually have to have them hidden in my office when they come. And um, even little bits like these, you can get them again in home savers. Um, there's this kind of a, a dog with flour in it. I use bubbles a lot because breathing is such an important, um, you know, I suppose I try to get all the young people trying to do breathing and grounding themselves, but sometimes they find it really difficult. So often we just blow bubbles and because they have to breathe, take a deep breath to blow the bubble and I'll try and get them to blow bigger bubbles. So this is just a tiny little stick that I have, but I have bigger, um, bigger bubbles they blow. Again, um, sometimes we'll have a game. It depends on the, you know, the student. We might blow a feather with a straw and again, it's trying to get the breathing to help regulate them. Um, you can have stuff like these. They're like, they can, you know, they just, they're fidget toys. Um, the boys tend to love this. They call it the, corona, the coronavirus. 
and it's again it's a toy, it's a squeezy ball. Um, so again, it's, you can get them all literally two euro shop, anyone in Ennis, Jimmy's, Home Savers. Um, you know, that's where I would have got it. And you'll see them in the sensory sections. They love these. And yeah, that's in some of these balls. And I'd often give, um, you can get stuff and you know, just those balls, squeegee balls. So yeah, and we just put them in little trays like this then. Yeah. Or could I ask you to possibly take some photos of those or put a list together that we can send out to attendees afterwards? I will, of course. Yeah, Yeah, no I, I think that would be a great resource for some people. Um, thanks very much for that, Cora. Um, we're going to move on to our last question, which I'm going to put to Sharon. Um, Sharon, what do you think are the biggest barriers services need to be aware of if they want to start becoming more trauma aware? Momentum. Um, so what, with all training, you know, or, uh, and so some people say, oh, trauma awareness or trauma, you know, this is the new buzzword, but it's not actually anyone who's ever worked from their heart or their gut in a frontline service when they come across this material, they go, ah, this is what I've been doing. I just didn't have a theoretical framework to, to, to hang my hat on. Um, so for those people and, and you know, when Jacinta and Eileen were talking earlier and they were saying about how many of their own staff had already gone ahead and, and, and you know, participated in training. So so that when you have that momentum or that coalition of the willing, that you appropriately support those people with time and resources to make sure that they can continue to follow it through. There will be people who say, oh, this is more tree huggy stuff. I'm not interested. So one of the things that I've done in the past is I've wasted too much of my energy on those people. So what and that was one of the things that we we learned from the Lancashire police as well, was that they just ignored them. They had their coalition of the willing and they said, we're going to focus on our own yoga mat and we have our, our very clear plan and we're going to stick to it and we're going to be successful and amazing. And then people will come along with us. So so having that right from the start. Um, so then in terms of barriers, like one of the things is that we are very Irish people can be very polite. I don't put myself into that bracket now, but in general, most people are. And in every organization I've ever worked in, there have been people when I put up that slide about the different aspects along the journey, one of the things that's in it is address issues. We have to be able to be really honest about the fact that sometimes we have individuals in our organizations who perhaps were never suited for the role or something's going on for them and they're 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 struggling right now about supporting them, you know. I mean, I spoke recently um somewhere, uh, not in Cork or Clare, right, but somewhere about trauma informed services. And I was walking through a hotel with a young woman who's who's experienced a lot of challenges in her life and, and now she's doing really, really well. And a woman stopped me in the corridor to say that she'd really enjoyed the talk about trauma and that that's what they do in their service. And she went away. But the young woman who'd been beside me told me that she had come down to breakfast in her slippers in the hotel. And that the woman who had just stopped to tell me how trauma aware she was had given her a really dirty look. Now, working class communities have their own customs and practices. And so you can not say that you're trauma aware about one group of people and then you go out and you look somebody up and down in a way that makes them feel less than. And that when we catch ourselves doing it, because we all do things like that, that we're honest with ourselves. And that we have honest conversations with our colleagues about things that are working and that are not. If you don't do that, if we are too, if we're not having awkward, difficult conversations, then it will never happen. So if myself and Jacinta are working together, for example, and I come in and I'm having a bad day and I say something unhelpful, perhaps even shitty, that uh, Jacinta has the, the um, permission from me and from the whole organization to say, Sharon, you know, that was a little bit unhelpful. Can we talk about what's going on? You know, so we have to be we have to be really walking it. Uh, otherwise it won't work. Thanks very much for that, Sharon. I, and yeah, it's an important point. People need to talk. They need to be open. They need they need to discuss these and they need to have they need to have those <clears throat> those talks, no matter how uncomfortable they might feel about they might feel about them. Um, so that was our last question. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up a few things before we say goodbye. Um, firstly, we will send out an email to all attendees um, later in the day that will include that will include copies of the slides. There's also access to access to the recording, which you can you can view the recording on this um, via the link that you were sent you were sent this morning. Um, 
Um, I'm going to reiterate a few of the thank yous that Lisa Marie already did. Um, so first I'd like, to I'd like to thank the the funders, so Sipsy Clare, Healthy Ireland and the ISPCC, who without their input, um, the Trauma Informed Working Group wouldn't exist in the first place. So thank you for being the driving force behind that. Uh, I'd like to thank Tusla Workforce Learning and Development, who have been working tirelessly, tirelessly in the background to make sure that there's been no technical glitches and everything went off without a hitch. So I really appreciate that because there is a full production team behind here that people don't know about. Um, I'd also like to thank my colleagues um, on the Trauma Informed Working Group. Um, members have been eating, breathing and sleeping webinar for the last couple of weeks um, and it's it's been very time consuming so thank you for all your efforts it's very much appreciated and finally and most importantly I would like to thank all the speakers Ashling, Sharon, Eileen, Jacinta, Cora, Elisa Marie. It is not an easy thing to to get up in public even behind a computer screen uh, and speak in front of and speak in front of over 100 attendees when asked everyone was was more than willing, delighted to do so, and that is very much appreciated. I have found today to be hugely informative, really educational, and I hope all the attendees have as well. And that's and that's purely down to the the content that you have all put across today. Um, so that's all I have to say. I hope everyone here found it as informative and educational as I did. And have a good day. And hopefully I'll talk to you again soon. Take care. Bye bye.